And welcome back. We're talking about the just concluded inaugural dialogue between China and the United States, focusing on law enforcement and cyber security. Let's get back to our panel right now. And Song, here's a sort of broad question on these comprehensive dialogues. You get two countries, China, the United States, major powers in the world. And if you listen to some of the language that candidate Trump used before the election, very tough on China. If you look at some of the language he used after he became president, still very tough on China. Uh, now they've completed four comprehensive dialogues on a wide range of issues, pretty important issues. So what, in the long term, is the diplomatic and political significance of this? I think uh, uh, from one way Mr. Trump has already realized uh, to be a president is very much uh, different from to be a, a candidate. And also he, he met uh, President Xi for several times. He now came to understand that uh, China has the, uh, the, the, the uh, willingness to, to cooperate with uh, him. And, uh, but many issues, including the cybersecurity, law enforcement, uh, economic co corporations are very, very complicated issue. And uh, I think he is returning back to the, uh, uh, the, the uh, normal wisdom. And uh, he wanted to uh, utilize this kind of dialogue uh, mechanisms to seek more chances to uh, make a mutual kind of understanding between US and China. I think that's a good sign for, for United States and for, for, for Chinese side. Ronald, you work uh, a lot on anti-corruption, data privacy, and things like uh, data security. Um, when you look at this agreement, actually, they're not calling it an agreement. They're calling it consensus. Um, does it make your job easier? Well, this is a very high level uh, uh, type of dialogue. And uh, I think the types of things that I focus on, especially when one talks about data security and data privacy, are things uh, that are done by individual regulators. For instance, in the United States, there is a whole system of laws and cases that address this issue. And in China, of course, the thing that everybody is paying attention to is the cybersecurity law. And at the governmental level, uh, the uh, US government uh, has expressed various opinions and concerns regarding this law. When it comes to this kind of a dialogue, I think it is important in that it helps to frame a certain approach towards addressing cybercrime. And so if the two countries are able to improve the relationship and to uh, 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 investigate cases and prosecute cases uh, addressed to this area, uh, then I think generally speaking, that is something that uh, private industry, uh, companies, individuals, those that are involved in cross-border data flows uh, would be interested in and would welcome. And I'm just wondering about the political sensitivities over these types of talks, because if we look at some of the language used, for instance, repatriation, is that just another term for extradition? No, it's different. Um, re repatriation actually has a very different meaning here, and it's different from the uh, use of fugitives. Repatriation actually refers to those nationals who are in the other country who are there without status. So for example, in the United States, there are a large number of Chinese nationals who are here uh, because their immigration status has expired or they may have entered illegally or perhaps they've committed crimes and therefore deprived themselves of whatever pr previously obtained status they may have. And the United States has an interest in returning those individuals to China. And that would be true for virtually every country around the world. Uh, there have been some difficulties in the past uh, in China accepting those individuals back uh, for various reasons, for legal reasons and for practical reasons. And so when one talks about repatriation, it really is addressed to that problem. Now, Fugitives are a related issue because a number of fugitives are here in the United States, again, without status or have broken the immigration laws. And so the United States is interested in prosecuting those individuals and certainly in returning them to China. Uh, and that may very much be related to the repatriation issue, but it is a separate issue. Uh, Christopher, if we look at the law enforcement provisions of this deal, how do they implement that? How does that work? Well, that requires a lot of coordination between Ministry of Public Security and our law enforcement agencies. And so we, we do have a, a history of coordination between our law enforcement agencies. So 
That aspect of it, I'm, I, I think, are, is less complicated, less um, controversial. I mean, for example, let's take the law enforcement aspect of cyber. Um, that may be the, the perhaps the most the easiest to implement because both China and the United States can agree on certain. It, it's it, that both countries can agree that you need to enforce your laws through that are being violated through cyberspace. For example, who is going to argue with each other about the need to stamp out child pornography on the internet? And so those types of issues, I think, are easier between the two countries to coordinate. When you get to questions of cyber sovereignty, who is, is it the individual who has, has free reign over what should be in the internet, or should it be the government establishing who has control over, uh, over cyberspace? Those become much more difficult issues to resolve. But on issues of crime within uh, the, the cyber domain, those become easier to resolve. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful with regard to law enforcement within the cyber domain, those are much more easier to, those are easier to, to resolve and work out. So Nian, what is your broad assessment? You know, there are some who've said that this dialogue, all the dialogues in fact, have been steps in the right direction, but I mean, do you think there are any flaws in them? Well, if we believe that U.S. China eventually will have to engage in engage each other in dialogues to solve their differences, then yes, these dialogues are the steps towards the right direction. But if you look at the, for example, the, the timeline of these four dialogues that have happened since Mar-a-Lago, apparently they have to be completed before, first of all, the 19th Party's Congress, and then secondly, before President Trump's upcoming visit to China. So I do think that there is a political game here to portray a very um, cooperative tone of the bilateral relations before these two big events happen. Yeah, it's something to hold up. Uh, <laughs> Song, uh, China established a new cybersecurity law in June, which requires local and overseas companies to submit security checks and store user data within the country, as it's put. The US has asked China not to implement that particular law. What can you tell us about that? I think, again, this uh, cyber issue is a new issue. There is no uh, universal understanding or kind of uh, consensus on these kind of issues. And I think China is just uh, trying to enhance its uh, kind of law system to tackle uh, the system. I think the intention, the, the motivation of this uh, uh, cyber, national cyber uh, law is to, to uh, uh, regulate the cyberspace in China and to fight against those kind of like uh, uh, terrorism and the cyber crimes. And on this specific part, uh, you're saying that uh, uh, foreign or uh, domestic companies are required to hand over their uh, their uh, tech knowledge and the data to, to data to the the, the, the uh, government of China and uh, U.S. companies are worried it might be uh, stolen or uh, taken away for some like experience uh, purpose. Mm -hmm. I think it's a kind of uh, suspicion and uh, it can be uh, communicated through uh, bilateral uh, dialogues and uh, I think China is already giving a lot of importance to this issue and uh, many, uh, many uh, actually policies have been already postponed from this last uh, June to by the end of next year. It's a kind of extra 18 months and I think China is w willing to hear from different countries and foreign uh, companies what are their uh, kind of suggestions. And uh, already uh, China is saying now we are not immediately asking the, 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 the uh, business uh, da data to be transferred out of uh, w within this country and uh, they can go back to uh, their own uh, countries at this moment and I think China is researching how to solve this is issue in a better way. Christopher, what is your broad assessment of these dialogues? I mean, it has its critics, it has its supporters, but it's a good model, isn't it? Could you, I, see, I, could I, you I, see it being extended to, say, other countries like Russia? Between the United States yeah, and Russia? Yeah. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think there's a, there's a, that's a, that's a difficult one. It, yeah. Well, additionally, I'm not a Russia expert. I, uh, uh, I, let, sticking strictly to, to, the, to the US, China, and their use of these dialogues, I, I find them uh, to be particularly useful. Uh, I'll give you a, a specific anecdote. So f six years ago, I was part of uh, the National Defense University, and I would go on these strategic dialogues with the People's Liberation Army National Defense University. And initially, we were asked to breach with the Chinese the question of, can we talk about cyber? Yeah. Can we dare discuss 
a very sensitive topic. And we would approach our PLA counterparts and say, is it possible to talk cyber? And initially, the answer was no, too sensitive. But through repeated dialogues, it got elevated up to this, uh, the SNED strategic and economic dialogue. And here we are right. now having formal discussions on, dial on, on cyber security. So my answer is yes. I think it, it serves as an important framework to move along the dialogue between the two countries. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us.